My name is Mike, and I put this slide program together because I was astounded that no one has been on the moon who have abandoned the moon for 51 years. And the process of getting there, to put it in perspective, in one human lifetime, in 1600 years, we went from riding in horses and buggies because there were no cars. And 69 years later, we were driving on the surface of the moon. And I was astounded by how quickly that happened and the change and the fact that having done it, we said, okay, we're done. And then we left. And flight is something that to me is wonderful. And I wish I could fly, but I unfortunately am blind in one eye and my other eye was borderline that I can see. And if you see me walking into a wall, there's a reason there. I have very bad eyes. But the dream of flight, everyone has dreamt of the, of the sky. I mean, when humanity builds things, you build up because you're trying to reach the sky. Some people say you're pointing to God. I'm not going to go there. I'm simply saying that the pyramid, the Great Pyramid of Giza, was the world's tallest human structure for 4,000 years, right? And then we have the, the other the other ones, the Empire State Building. And I'm going to be talking about the Empire State Building during this program. And people have always dreamt of how to get up there. Flying carpet. The flying carpet's wonderful. I don't know if that's it, that it's, it's a Persian tradition. I don't know if it, were, if it came to India. But it certainly is a Persian tradition to fly on a rug. All right? And everybody still to this day is saying, man, it's soaring like an eagle. I actually love this picture. Look at the mountains in the background. How someone got that close to the bird is sort of incredible. How did that happen? I can't imagine how they did that. These five, these are wonderful. Aren't they pretty? Get it here. A bee is a beautiful insect. What's really interesting is that the question exists. The serious question, can a bee fly? When you look at the bee, it's got a fat little body and it's got short little wings. Okay, so it's a very serious question of can a bee fly? And there was a, a gathering of, of wealthy individuals and at that gathering, there was an engineer and they said, can the bee fly? And the engineer thought about it. He took a piece of paper and he sketched and uh, did some equations and said, absolutely, bees cannot fly. Short little body, tiny little wings. It's impossible for a bee to fly as far as he, it took them. It took 60 years to figure out how a bee can fly because the wings do these really unusual things as they move. Okay? And eventually they said, yep. Bees fly. Isn't it nice to know that bees fly? It really is. It's nice to know to this movement. Men of genius have thought about flight. Leonardo da Vinci. That's actually Leonardo's self portrait. It is the only picture of Leonardo that we know of that is him. Okay. And he designed a flying machine. And you would love to fix that because it had like one moving part, right? Right? The fact that Leonardo da Vinci was worried about flight 600 years ago gives you a sense that the goal of flying is wonderful, right? You had eventually, this button, there we go. We had Sir Isaac Newton, one of the world's greatest men. And in a period of his life, he did so, he invented the calculus. He invented this. He invented that in one year. If you ever carry coins in your pocket, if you have a dime, I don't have a dime in my pocket, but if you have a dime or a quarter and you look at the dime and a quarter, the dime and a quarter says to you, I was invented by this man, by Isaac Newton. How do you know that? Because the edges of the coins have slits on them. They are milled. He was responsible for English coinage during a time when coins were made of real silver, of real gold. 
And the thing that you did is you build up a tiny little piece of gold. So over time, you accumulated wealth. And he said, I can stop this. I'm going to create a coin, and the coin is going to have marks on the edges, and we will know exactly what was done to this coin. So in your pocket, if you have a quarter, if you have a dime, not a penny, not a nickel, half dollar, I don't remember. Maybe half dollar too has milling on the edge. Half dollar has milling. I don't have one. Okay. And he looked at having been hit by an apple. He said, apple falls to the ground. There's a moon right over my head. Why is the moon not falling down? And he thought about it. He said, the moon is moving in a straight line. It passes the earth. The earth has gravity. And the gravity pulls it down. And as the earth is pulling it, the moon is continuing in where it wants to be. It's in a straight line. So at any instant, it's moving out. And then gravity pulls it down. He came up with this idea in the year 1629. I'm making that up, by the way. Okay, order of magnitude 1600s. Fast forwarding now to the year 1783. I'm going to be talking to you about a balloon. Okay, because we are trying to go into the sky, right? To this point in history, nobody has flown. And on this day, it was the first time that someone flew. Okay? First time ever. These two brothers, who were responsible for manufacturing cloth, came up with the idea that we can make a balloon of cloth, we can make it airtight, and we can put hot air in it. Benjamin Franklin and Louis XIV were physically there watching the balloon go up. That balloon, that's a reproduction. Okay, but two men got on board, they went half a mile in the air, and the wind carried them for five miles. And the brothers worried before they did this that the men were going to die because no one in the whole of human history had been up in a balloon half a mile in the air. So, what do you do? You take animals, put the animals on. You make them go up first. And if they come back down and they're alive, say, hey, life is good. People will do it. Okay? The Germans then looked at that system of a balloon going up and said, we can do better. We can build that balloon. And that balloon is called a dirigible in that it literally has a frame inside of it. And they fill that puppy with helium. Hydrogen, you're right, hydrogen, with hydrogen. The difference between hydrogen and helium, hydrogen burns, helium doesn't. The United States had a boatload of helium. We did not let the Germans have any, okay? It was literally a military asset. But the Germans said, we can take this and we can put people, and let's see, I wonder if this works. There's a little laser button here. And if I push this button over here, yes, there it is, that. You can put people in there. The Germans actually built, when they built the big ones, could put 100 people on board. The Germans said, we are going to take a dirigible. We are going to go over the Atlantic. We're going to travel at 84 miles an hour. Three days later, we're going to show up over New York. That's what New York looked like. Oh, my God, it had like nothing. Amazing to me, amazing to me, is that this is part of a system. So not only you have to build the sucker, but you have to get it down. Okay? When they built the Empire State Building, they said the dirigibles will float up. We will play catch to a rope. We will winch them in, and people will get out of the dirigible, and they go into the waiting room in the Empire State Building. And the plan said, the way down, because these are foreigners, on the way down, they would pass through customs, and they would be on the street of Manhattan. Ah, the vision of this is incredible. They were never able to do this, but they tried. They tried. 
And then it's oh god, that era sort of years. because the Hindenburg, as it was approaching its landing area in New Jersey, blew up. And there's a famous line, and I don't understand how the man, the, the man recording this said, "Oh, the humanity." Um, yeah, because there were a hundred people on board, and it would be an impressive fire. But the Hindenburg blew up, and no one to this day really understands why it blew up, because they really, really did everything they could to make the Hindenburg fireproof. Now, fireproof. Underneath that, remember I said there were 100 people? It was actually a two-story high gondola underneath the Hindenburg, and in one of those levels, I don't remember which one, they had a smoking room. So if you wanted to smoke a cigar, you went into the smoking room on the Hindenburg, with millions, a million cubic feet of highly fat flammable hydrogen, and you could smoke. And it was designed such that no matter what you did, the spark would not get out. Wait, isn't it? That is it. Engineering, interesting engineering, right? I have talked about balloons. I have not talked about aircraft, have I? Okay? There were none. Zero, zip, none, none. Not a single aircraft in the entire world until you had Orville and Wilbur. And they are known as the Wright brothers. And that is what is called a Wright flyer. And a Wright flyer is 605 pounds, not counting the weight of Orville right there lying down. And two propellers, 40 feet wings, wingspan? That's a question. I should know this. When you say wingspan, am I talking about each wing is 40 feet? Or am I talking end to end? Doesn't really matter. Okay. I would guess it's end to end. Okay. That's what I think. Okay. So that point. All right. So we have a right flyer there. And they said, we are going to go to Kitty Hawk. We are going to go down a hill. We are going to go into a wind and we are going to fly. And when we do, we will be the first time in history that a heavier than air machine got off the ground. And that is a photograph of the first flight with Orville flying. Okay? Photograph. You can't make that up. You see Wilbur standing next to it. Okay, there are five witnesses watching this. Okay, the wind was 27 miles an hour into their faces. Okay, it wound up going at six miles an hour, because 27 mile an hour wind, right? It was over the ground, 12 seconds. Look at that. Six months later, more or less, we're up to flying for five minutes. Okay. We are now flying a couple of miles at a time, right? And nobody believed it was happening. Scientific American was writing articles that said the Wright brothers, flyers, or liars. No one believed, even though there were pictures of it. Okay? I mean, what these men did uh, changed the world. U.S. Army, U.S. Army Signal Corps in 1908, having figured out that actually these men were doing what they said they could do, said, we will give anybody a $25,000 contract if you can do this. There were some specifications. You have to have two people on board, okay? And we want to go 40 miles an hour, top speed, 40 miles an hour. But if you can go faster than 40 miles an hour, for every mile an hour over 40, we'll give you $2,500 more. We are talking big league kind of stuff here, right? And this was a formal thing over a measured course with observers. And on one of the flights, the guy in the passenger seat was Lieutenant Selfridge. And he got on board the plane. And Orville was flying. And they went up in the air and they were around 100 feet high when the tower broke. And when you fall from 100 feet, it's not a good thing. 
Well, not a good thing. And Lieutenant Selfridge was killed and Orville was badly injured. And for the rest of his life, he was in pain. Mm -hmm. But the trials in general were a spectacular triumph for the Wright brothers. Unfortunately, you had other people who were stealing their ideas, right? Glenn Curtis was one of them, right? And so the Wright brothers had to fight to defend what they had invented, make some money on it. What astounds me of the many things that astound me, okay, is that literally three years later, they were looking at airplanes and saying, we're not going to allow them to be used as weapons of war. Who would think three years after inventing something that you have to worry about using it to kill somebody? And yet that's what they did. 1911, they tried to ban airplanes as weapons of war. And which we know was a very successful attempt. Okay? Which we know was a very successful attempt. Uh, a cathedral, one of the cathedrals in France to remember World War I. You can see lower right hand corner here. I push that button. I push that button. All right? Dead English soldier. And you see planes to remember. A dead English soldier. There's a battlefield in. In, in Belgium. Yes. It, wasn't it one of the Wright brothers who said the invention of the airplane would make war so horrible it would end war? Everybody was trying to end war. Yes. So I mean, someone, I thought someone famous though actually made that, that statement. I have not heard that, that was one of the Wright brothers. Well, I don't know who it was. It's okay. Okay. So, someone uh, said the machine gun. The machine gun. That, would, that, that was make that. war so horrible. Yes. And I don't remember who that was, yeah. but I know that he's a Maxim. Maxim. Yeah. And, and similar to that, uh, General Grant is reported to have said that uh, it, it's a good thing that war is horrible, or he's really fond of it. Said that at the battlefield of Fredericksburg, where his artillery was on top of the hill, at the bottom of the hill was a stone wall, and he had his troops behind the stone wall. And in front of them was an absolutely flat quarter mile field with a canal, and the Union marched their troops towards the stone wall. And the Confederates killed. And there were 14 attacks, and a thousand men fell in each and every attack. And General Grant said, <laughs> It's a good thing this is horrible. And the guy at the bottom, yes, Fred Fredericksburg, Grant was not at Fredericksburg. I'm sorry, I'm a Lee. Lee, Lee. Yeah. Lee said how horrible it was. It's good that people actually listen to what I said. Okay, it really is. Lee said that. And the general at the bottom, and I don't remember his name, said, You give me enough ammunition and I will kill every soldier in the Union Army. Because his men were behind a stone wall this high. Yes. So World War I, they were using fighter planes. And you remember here the Battle, the battle of Ypres, uh, uh, order of magnitude, because it's hard to get exact counts. In France, the, there's a poem. Uh, in Flanders Field, the poppies flow. Between the crosses, row on row. In Flanders Field's battlefield is more or less the size of the head. 10 or 12 miles long, a mile or two wide. On geography that big, two million casualties were incurred in four years. Okay? And they would move the line a thousand yards, and then there would be a return this way, and then they would move the line a thousand yards. And to move the line a thousand yards, they lost 30,000 people in a day. So yes, World War One was an interesting, horrible. One of my programs is going to be on World War One, and in it you still remember World War One. You still remember the Red Baron, who shot down eighty-three flyers before he was killed, and he was not killed in the air by another flyer. 
it looks like he was shot by a rifleman on the ground who shot upwards, and the body entered his, the bullet entered his, his body. An incredible brave man, though. He wrote the textbook on how to fight in the air. World War II. Okay, we are still flying propeller planes. I have read that the P-51 is considered top of the line, that this was the ultimate fighting plane for World War II. All right? The problem was that the Germans had just obsolesced all that technology. Okay, that is a buzz bomb, a P-1. And that is a jet engine on it. And a buzz bomb would go through 200 miles an hour faster than an airplane. So the technology changed really quickly. Right? And for those of you who don't know, if you're curious about miracles, the fact that a plane can go off the ground into the air is not a miracle. Okay, that is relatively simple and straightforward. What you have to do is you have to have a shape on the wing. It is called an airfoil, and it's curved on top. And if wind passes over that surface, turns out the air pressure over the surface is less. And so the plane is literally sucked upwards. All you have to do is get the air to pass over the wind. First air flight was 120 feet ever, the Wright's first flight. That's a wing, and it's hard to tell that it's curved. But those engines are generating thrust in that direction. Okay? That's all it does, is it moves it forward. But moving it forward gives you wind. You don't care how the wind is generated. Okay? The wind passes over the wing, and the plane gets sucked into the air. That's an Airbus. The fact that that can go into the air is, for me, a miracle. I, I'm sorry. Even though I understand how it's happening, look at that. That goes in the sky, and there's two levels of seating above it, and the whole bottom of it is filled with luggage. All right? Talk about planes a little bit. Talk about jet engines. What about rockets? Rockets are interesting. Rockets are old, right? The Chinese were building rockets 2,000 years ago, maybe 3,000 years ago. Hmm? You still see them today, fireworks. They actually use them as weapons of war. You send something in a direction that the other troops, when it lands, it explodes. Weapon of war. In 1926, that man figured out that you can put liquid fuel into that tube, set it on its end, and light it off, and it's going to go into the sky. And his name is Robert Goddard, and he is the father of NASA. Hmm? Oops, I lost the picture. There we go. Our father, the Germans, the Germans used the same technology. They did better than the V1. They came up with the V2. The V2 was a long-range guided ballistic missile. It would go up. It would go to London. It would come down. And when it, come, it came down, hmm, it was, there was a ton of explosives on board. And it was German. Yes. No. So what about the V1? How many of those were fired? Were they used extensively in World War I? Two. Total. This is this is V this is the V two. I do not remember how many V ones they were used. I may have seen it once. Good question, though. One of the things about V ones that they were able to almost catch up to it. And shoot it down. As if you know it's coming at you, and you know where you can position a plane, and you have to shoot it down. Couldn't do that with a V two. Right. Well, you could actually, they actually, the, you could see the wing on the V one. What they would actually do instead of shooting it down, they would try to get wing kick to wing kick and flip 
because the, uh, there was no internal stabilization and flip it, so it would simply crash. Yeah. Ah, I did not know that. I wouldn't have thought it was possible because you have how to catch it. Okay. Well, this is this man is the father of the V2 German. And if you discuss with him the fact that he was building a weapon to go and kill the British, he would say, Yeah, it's war. You want me to do it my job? Well, the, the worst thing about Leonard von Braun is that he is slave labor. Uh, uh, yes. and, and no, and he claims he really didn't have a good idea of what you know. Well, I just designed the thing, but you know, it's it's very controversial what he did know and what he didn't know about who was building. Absolutely the truth. Absolutely the truth. Yeah. All the men were the army. That is the day. We got them. We entered the war. We came and we took them. The Russians did what they could. They went to the German engineers and they took theirs. So the two sides were involved in a brain race looking for people who understood about rockets, right? He's the father of the Saturn V. And question, fundamental question, since I've shown you planes, I've shown you rockets. If you're going into space, do you want to fly up there or do you want to rocket up there? Fundamental question, how do you get up to space, right? That is an X1, X meaning experimental. Okay, it's a rocket powered plane. And in 1947, Chuck Yeager, who was a who retired as a general, probably was a lieutenant at the time, I don't remember, um, broke the sound barrier. There was an interesting question whether or not you could physically go faster than the speed of sound. Okay, they literally called it the sound barrier because it was considered for a while to be impossible to go through. And he did. I vaguely remember that he had a cracked rib that day. Did that ring a bell? And he refused to admit it. Okay, and he refused to admit it, and he went up anyhow. Brave man. U.S. top military secret that we have broken the sound barrier. That was, yes, he did it. Nobody was allowed to know. Mm -hmm. The X-1 was superseded by this plane, which is, oh, God, that's gorgeous. Minor technical problem with that plane is that look at the stubby little wings. We already know that stubby little wings are not going to be enough to get you up off the ground because there's no airfoil sufficient to lift the, lift the weight. If you want to get an X 15 flying, what you do is you attach it to a B 52. Okay? You send the B 52 up in the air at more or less 30,000 feet in the air. You say goodbye. And you drop it. And the pilot on board the X 15 is hoping, he really is hoping that his engine is going to start because he is now falling from six miles in the air. But if it starts, an X 15 was clocked at 3,856 miles per hour which basically said it could have gone more or less east coast to west coast in 45 minutes. Hmm? That plane would go 50 miles into the air, more than 50 miles into the air. There's a question of where space begins. So sort of the, 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 if you make it 50 miles away from the earth, you're in space. Only 12 men in history have flown an X-15. Eight of them went over 50 miles high. So those eight were technically our first eight astronauts. Compare that to a bullet. It's about twice as fast as a bullet. Oh, I forgot. The engines. The engines on the X-15 were built not far from here. There was something called reaction motors, and reaction motors invented them. And when they were tested, Picatinny Arsenal still has the test platform. What you do is you take the engine and you put it on its end, 
and you fire it. But you can't fire it this way because it wants to go that way, right? So there's this massive concrete platform that they would stand the engines on, and that platform to this day is branded as the gateway to space because those engines were used not only in the X-15, but also in the space shuttles. That's us. Reaction Motors is a company that has forgotten. Mm -hmm. And this is what it looks like when it comes down. You'll notice it doesn't have wheels at the end. And they go skiing when they come in. But it had limitations, one of which is you couldn't get off the ground, another one of which is how long is it going to fly? It's a rocket powered engine. So here they came up with the SR 71 because one of the things you want to do is you want to get over the Soviet Union and you want to see what the communists are doing. And this plane could. I love this picture. The U2 they go along the border. Oh, okay. But it never got over, but they were afraid of the big 25. Which was designed to shoot down P 70s, but to be able to shoot that down. They didn't find out until years after that it couldn't. Huh. They kept that from flying over the, uh, kept it from flying over it. I mean, the U 2 went over the U 2 went over because they didn't think anybody could the reach that. Did not. But this, well, the Russians learned. I did not know that. Yeah. So All they, right. They created the, the, uh, the, uh, what was the, uh, the, 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 they're going after the B-70, but the B-70 program was canceled, but they continued developing the plane. Okay. But the plane was somewhat of a failure, but it was frightening enough, and the Americans' uh, intelligence was not sufficient to know that until one of the pilots affected to Japan to go on with them, that the plane could not catch the, you know, catch the SR-71, but by that time it was already done by satellites. There is so much in history that is just so interesting. It really is. So it's a fly along the border, but never actually penetrate right. airspace. Thank you. To the Blackbird. Okay. In the like meantime, the <laughs> while we are doing planes, the, the Russians are doing planes too. But one of the things they did was they put over the United States around the world the first satellite called Sputnik. And it passed overhead. And when it's passed overhead, it said, hello, United States, we can drop an atomic bomb on you and you can't do anything about it. Technically, I'm translating for you. What it said in Russian was beep, 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 beep. What that meant was, we can drop an atomic bomb on your head and you can't do anything about it. And literally a month later, the Russians put a dog into orbit around the Earth. Butnik or, or Lakita, that was a stray dog on the streets of Moscow, and they wanted to find out if living human, living creatures could survive in space. And unfortunately, she burned up. The Russians said that they euthanized her, that is not quite true, but first living creature to be in space. And then two years later, they took an internet, an intercontinental ballistic missile that they had. Called, I, don't know, I, I want to say it's called Vostok. They renamed it the Vostok. It was, a, it was designed to drop an atomic bomb in the United States. And they said, We are now going to go and put a human being into space because we know dogs can be up there. And they were going to test. And the way you test is you drop, you put Ivan Ivanovich, who is a dummy, in the capsule. He goes up, he comes down, and they say, Yep, yeah, it works. All right, now what we're going to do, literally on March 9th, right? March 9th, they put up a dummy of a human being. April 11th, same year, they said, okay, get on board, fly around the earth. And Yuri Gargarin is the first man to orbit the earth. Now, technically, technically, again, remember I said that 50 miles high is where space begins? There are people who say, well, to count as you've flown in space, you have to actually land with what you came up on. He didn't. As he was coming back to Earth, he opened the hatch and parachuted out. 
Okay, so depending on who you are, you'd say, yeah, well, he really wasn't the first because he didn't ride the capsule all the way down. But that's that history has all these arguments too. All right. Now, America, America response, right? President Kennedy considers the Russians have a lead in space. What are we going to do? Interestingly, this picture, which is the official painted portrait of President Kennedy, was painted after he had died, after he'd been assassinated, at the express request of his wife. Okay, and but he gave a speech shortly before he was murdered, and he said, "We choose to go to the moon in this decade, and do other things too, which I write down. Not because they are easy, because they are hard." And he said, "We, America, will get to the moon in this decade." This is now. There are eight years and three months left in the decade. He is promising that we will do it, and to put a man on the moon is basically the Manhattan Project. And we are talking about half a million people working nonstop for eight years. This was non trivial and really expensive, and you want to keep the American population interested in this. Okay. And so, who's going to do this? The Freedom Seven. They went out and they hunted the best of the best of the best American pilots, okay? And they came up with seven. The process started with looking at 508 of the best pilots and they whittled the number down to seven. Scott Carpenter became one of the names that you'll hear um, every name of those seven is famous. Of them, Alan Shepard became the first man to go, first American to go into space, All right? John Glenn is the first American to orbit the Earth. That's Alan Shepard, okay? Could you imagine the decision process to wind up with Alan Shepard when your competition had the others, okay? He must have been a very special man. Hmm? Having gone into space, he was expecting to go back. And then one day he fell down. He said, I don't understand why I'm falling down, but I'm busy and he fell down. And they discovered that he had a disease in the ear, his ear filled with liquid and he lost his ability to fly. And so he was grounded. He was grounded for the next order of magnitude 10 years, and they did an experimental surgery in his ear to put a tube to drain it into his spinal column. They said, all right, you're good to go. And they put him to command Apollo 14. So he not only was the first man, first American in space, but he was also one of the 12 in history to walk on the moon. Senator John Glenn, everybody knows John Glenn's name. There's actually a reason. He was only the third American in space. He wasn't the first, because we just talked about the first, he wasn't the second. He was the third, the first to orbit. And there are actually reasons for this. He was a non-trivial, World War, okay, Korean War, air hero, but they all were. Okay, um, he would come back from uh, from a flight over uh, Korea, where he was going against uh, against Soviet base uh, in shrapnel, and he was saving his co-pilots, the men in the air with him. And when they would come back, they counted the holes that he had in his plane. And at least twice, they counted north of 250 holes in his plane. They said he had zero fear. He would say no, that I was always afraid. And he did it. And we were talking about a great man. Not only did he fly around in orbit, he went back and did it again. 
He did it again when he was, ah, I make this up. I think he was 80 years old. He went back into space. A piece of trivia, his wife, his wife was named Anne. He was a toddler, two years old, when he met Anne, two years old. And if you ask either of them, was there ever a time that they did not know each other? They knew each other their entire lives. Isn't that romantic? Gotta admit, that's nice. All right? After you have the one man flights, what are we gonna do? We're gonna have two man flights. We now know that we can put a man into orbit. There are things that we need to do. All right? How many times are we gonna go up? Well, we have a bunch of intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles just standing around called Titan missiles. They are designed to put a nuclear bomb in Russia. What we're going to do is we'll take the nuclear bomb off. We are going to put a capsule. Did I describe how I've done that well? And we're going to put a capsule. The capsule will have two men, right? And 10 of the flights had two men on board. These were the Gemini missions. And they did things that were needed to get to the moon. For example, you really need to get to the moon to dock to something else in space. To get to the moon, you have to go outside your capsule and float around. But all sorts of things that they had to learn to do that had never been done before. It has been described the docking is to find something in space is sort of like. I'm going to stand over there and I'm going to throw an apple over the building. And you are going to stand over there and throw a rock in that direction. And we're going to try to meet. Okay? It was sort of that hard. And Gemini did successfully everything that was necessary. And every now and then things would go wrong. Okay, Gemini 8 had two astronauts, Gemini, okay? Uh, the guy on the left is Armstrong, a name you're probably familiar with. And the capsule started tumbling because there was a whoops moment as a thruster started thrusting on its own and the capsule started tumbling. And it got so bad that they literally had seconds before they lost consciousness. That's how bad the tumble was. And we would have had two dead in space. Luckily, they were able to separate from the other half of the command module because they were practicing. And they then were able to control the tumble by actually firing the retro rockets to bring them back down. That's what they had to do. And the whole point of everything we're talking about was to get to the moon, okay? And people have been looking at the moon for you know, as long as just the humanity. You look up there and say, I wonder what's up there. Bernard von Braun is standing at the foot of a Saturn V. What I find astounding, Saturn V has five engines. You can see one, two, three, Four would be in the upper right hand corner and a center one. The center one stays there. It is the center one. It doesn't move. The other ones squiggle around. You can steer a Saturn V by moving those four outside engines. Isn't that amazing? Engineers do interesting things. All right. So we're going to take a Saturn V and we are going to stand it on its end and we are going to bring it to the launch pad. It is assembled in the vehicle assembly building, and they put it on what is called the crawler, which is the world's largest car. And it travels at one mile an hour. So eventually it gets to the launch pad. The Saturn V is fueled. Pretty picture. And they light it off. And it begins going up. They can steer that, hard to believe. And you look at that. Can you imagine me 
sitting on top of that much of an explosion, let's be real, ain't going to happen. Took a rare type of, right? Takes a rare type of courage. The, it is written that Glenn and Armstrong they went to look at one of the tests and the rocket went up, not a, not a Saturn V, an earlier rocket. Rocket went up and as it went up, it went and exploded. And they looked at each other and said, good that we got that out of the way. So they knew, they knew what the dangers were to some extent. Hmm. July 19th, 1969, that is the 11th Apollo mission. A unique picture. There's actually things happening right here. Oops, oh no, oh no, oh no, I know, I hit too many buttons. Right there. You see the cloud that's right there? It's amazing if you do something going through the air fast enough that the air does weird things. So a cloud gathered around it. It's not a cloud, it's a whatever it is. And on July 20th, they got to the moon. And I'm not talking about all the, all the steps involved, because there's other things to talk about. That's a picture of the first footstep. And Neil Armstrong got on the radio and said a giant step for man, right? And women all around the world said, what about us? That's not quite true, that happened later. At the time, the entire world came together because this was a world uniting event. And later on, they said, eh. and he said, I really meant to say it was one giant step for a man, all right? Mistake. In the process of getting to the moon, if it could have gone wrong, it went wrong, okay? All the time. And what they attempted to do was get the astronauts prepared for something going wrong. So they would sit them in a simulator and they'd say, okay, let's pretend this is real. And they would do something. And so they would, we're taking off, we're hitting switches, we're doing this. And all of a sudden the light would go off and say, there's a mistake, something just happened. You didn't expect this, did you? What are you gonna do now? Because you have to fix it or you die. There was something like 200 distinct failures in a simulator that the men had to go through to learn how to handle. And even with all of those, new ones happened. As Neil Armstrong was landing the limb on the moon, on the way down to the surface on the moon, the light went off and it said that the 202 error, 202 error, it's 202 error. How the 202 error? We have never seen a 202 error in all of the tests that we have done. All the things that they've thrown at us to train us, there has never been a 202 error. And in the mission control room, they were scratching the head. I know what that is. It says the computer is being overloaded. We can ignore that. And that's what happened. They said, ignore it keep going down. And as they were going down, they suddenly realized that the landing site had all these boulders. To, you know, so Neil Armstrong had to find the next landing site as you're falling to the moon, right? And as he's trying to find a place to put it down, the counter that says this is the number of seconds of fuel you have left is ticking down. And I don't remember the exact number. I want to say it was like eight seconds of fuel left when they finally touched the moon. And while all this is going down, he has to be calm. Do his job. Or they die. Right? A unique man. And his co-pilot was worried that he was going to be so focused on the landing that he wasn't going to be paying attention to the big thing, which was that humanity had finally gotten to a new planet. 
and there were discussions of who should be the first one to step on the moon. The man who had more bandwidth to think about it, or the captain or the guy who's piloting it. And he is the first man to touch the moon. All right, so here's the question for you. Who is the second man? You know who the first on the moon was? That's Neil Armstrong. Those are your two choices. If Michael Collins or Erwin Aldrin. Aldrin? Second man on the moon. One of them was up on the... Uh... Collins was above. Collins, was he, was he American? Was Collins American? They were American. We agree. Was Collins born in America? Collins was not born in America. His parents were in Italy for a diplomatic mission when he was born. But he is American, American parents. Okay? Everybody, all of the Freedom Seven were American, that's for sure. Look at the real estate that you get. Look at the view that you get. You gotta admit, location, location, location. What a view. Of course, it's lonely. There is you and nobody else, or there are two of you have landed. That's it, there's nothing there, all right? It is certainly not Earth. I want to pause for a second and talk about LEM, the Lunar Excursion Module, all right? One of the ways to go to the moon, you take a rocket, and off, and you go back to the moon and you land, right? Clear? Okay. Problem is the rocket's very heavy. You saw how big the Saturn V is. So you take off and land, it's huge. What they did was they said, no, 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 no. What we're going to do, we're going to put it up and we're going to take a piece of it and it is going to the moon. Makes sense? She had now peace. Oh, I should have done it this way, should have done that way, but okay, peace, peace lands on the moon. And they said, same logic. You need the whole piece to come up. No, no, no. We will take the lemma, we will divide it in half. We will leave the part that lands. Isn't that clever? You gotta admit that was clever. They were worried about how heavy it was and the weight necessary because you have fuel to get it up. All right, so the engineers are looking at the lemma. We've decided we're cutting it in half. We are worrying about weight. Are you comfortable? Nice chair. Nice chair. Hey, your arms are padding. The engineers. The engineer said, why are we giving those astronauts chairs as they're going to the moon? There are no chairs on the limb. The men stood. There were straps from the ceiling to keep them from bobbing around. No chairs, because they saved weight. Okay? The windows are not round. The windows are triangles. Saves weight. They did everything they could to save weight because when you land, you have to get off because it would be a very bad thing if they abandoned you on the moon. A bad thing. All right? And this is half of the eagle coming back. Half. It never makes it to Earth. I don't know if it's still in orbit. But half the eagle came off the moon, the men got out of it, they went back into, and eventually they landed. Hmm? On one of the trips, they left behind a moon buggy, okay, which is called a lunar rover. Technically, it's not a moon buggy, all right? And the reason they brought this up is they wanted to be able to explore the moon a little bit to see what's out there. And then this can't really go far, right? So they actually planned on seeing what was out there, okay? I'm not going to talk about the 13th mission, which was a very bad thing that happened because the uh, capsule on the way to the moon sort of exploded. And Apollo 13 is a great movie describing what happened, but they managed to come back. Mm. And the American public at this point was saying things like, 
Uh, how many games? Why are you excited about going to the board? You can pick up some rocks. Trust me. How much are we spending to go to the moon? And so Congress said, yeah, we had this giant project, the Manhattan Project, the moon, 400,000, 500,000 men working for 10 years, but we've been there. But stop. They stopped. Apollo 17 is the last mission that went to the moon. So 1972, it is 2023. You do the math, it's 51 years ago that man has not been on the moon. So here's the question Who is the last of the 12? Who is the last human? To be on the moon. We think there's only 12 of them. It's not like there's lots of choices, right? So who's the last person to stand on the moon? That's a hint. That's his picture. Yeah. I'm giving you help here. Okay? I'm trying to help. I'm being nice. Oops, I lost the picture. There we go. His name's Gene. 1972, the last man. And then the United States started doing other things. Uh, they built the space shuttle. Let us, in this story, let us not ignore the fact that there was a price, people dying. All right? Apollo 1, Gus Grissom, Edward White. Roger Chaffee burned to death. They were doing what was considered to be a routine test. And they burned to death. Turns out that the inside of the capsule has Velcro everywhere because in space you don't want stuff floating around. So you take it, you stick it to Velcro. Velcro is fine, it doesn't burn in space. Does it burn when you only have a little bit of oxygen in the air? On a test on Earth, where you have oxygen at Earth pressure, Velcro goes off like, took him 15 seconds to burn to death. Gus Grissom was the second man in space, the United States. He was the first American to be in space multiple times. Ed White was the first American to walk in space. Roger Chaffee apparently was a rookie. Apparently he was a unique man. He had a habit, he would go to a factory where everybody always dealt with the executives. He would hunt down the workers. He'd say he appreciated what they were doing. Okay, unique men. Vladimir Komarov, he, went into space in a Russian capsule that in his estimation was a death trap. And he said, I could refuse. And if I refuse, Yuri is going to be sent on board the ship and he will die. And he chose to go up. And the litany of all the things that went wrong with that flight is astounding. And he was still alive as he was heading to Earth. And on the radio, he was cursing out all the people who had done engineering terror, such a horrible job. Right, Teresa, it's a horrible job. I use the engineering terms at that point, okay? It, is, it has been reported that when they opened the capsule after it hit the earth, his body was any bigger. Because the understand the difference is that the Russians, their space capsules landed in Russia on, on land, on, on land. earth, whereas we it deliberately worked. planned that our capsules will all land in the ocean. Yeah. So I need to land in the ocean is a problem. Gus Grissom landed the second freedom flight and 
the hatch is supposed to not open, and then when you want it to open, it explodes open, and the hatch chose to explode on its own. And all of a sudden, he was in Freedom 7 as it was sinking. Okay, and he had to get out of Freedom 7, and his suit had various holes in it, not rips, tears, but places where oxygen was supposed to be plugged into it, and water was entering into his flight suit, and he is drowning. And luckily, they were able to save him. And they said, why did you blow the hatch so soon? He said, I had everything ready, but I didn't blow it. And he said, it blew. He says, I have no idea how it blew. Okay. The next pilot refused to, he said, to blow it, you hit, you hit something with your hand, you hit the handle, and it, and it explodes, and you have a bruise on your hand. Next pilot proved that refused to open up the hatch till they brought him on board the carrier. And then he went like that, and he said, look at my hand. Okay, years later, they determined that static electricity was able to set off the detonation. Thus, the person was not at fault. We have, of course, the people on board Challenger. We have the people on Columbia. We should never forget these people. There was a price. I have exactly five minutes of extra uh, material. Ellen, five minutes more? Five minutes more, okay? A lot of people died, and I haven't shown pictures of all of them, okay? But it was dangerous. You saw the race in that they did this, and next month they did that, and a month after that they did that. There wasn't time to do it right, and they tried, right? For the next decades, we are anticipating moving forward in our pursuit of space, okay? Richest man in the world has a company called Blue Origin. And it's interesting is that going up to space now is a commercial thing. If you wanted to, if you wanted to, you could pay and get on board and go fly into space. And I think that's incredible. And Captain Kirk did so. I think they allowed him to go for free. I don't think they charged him. Captain Kirk, of course, is fictional. That's a real man. Does anybody know his name? William Sackler. William Sackler. Okay. There is a man named Richard Branson who has a, a, a company called Virgin Galactic. And that is a Virgin Galactic rocket heading into space. And you have Elon Musk. Elon Musk has a company called SpaceX. And one of the things that SpaceX is doing besides putting people in orbit is they're putting satellites, as in thousands of satellites because the Earth is being surrounded by a communication system. And it's one of the things that they use in Ukraine. The Ukrainians are using his satellite system, but the Russians can't access. And that is a, I love this picture. That is a picture of a rocket launch of a SpaceX rocket that is bringing satellites into space, into low Earth orbit. And we are heading now back to the moon and to Mars. They're actually planning to do this. 10 years ago, there was a company formed that said, I'm looking for volunteers who want to go to the Mars and die. And thousands of people said, this is what they would love to do. And the company tried for a couple of years to get funding to get the Mars that ran out of money. But the United States is actually planning to go there, right? And in our lifetime, we will never go to the stars because you have no idea how far these stars are, none. But in the story, there is lots. You've got heroes, you've got villains, and you've got tragedies, and you've got triumphs. And every now and then I make a YouTube video and my channel is called Be More Better. I have six videos right now on space, on different aspects of it. But a lot of the material that you're seeing here 
is comes from the videos and the research I've done. And every and, and, and one of the things I love doing is I keep finding new things. The fact that John Glenn and his wife to be were this big and they were munchkins together is so romantic. And that is it. Ellen, if you want to give us likes, I will answer questions.